So welcome. Um, maybe by background a little bit, how I became a value investor. My grandmother comes from the Black Forest and my grandfather from the mining area of the Ruhr Valley. And uh, so my father was a, a Council of Wise Men member and a chief economist of, of Citibank and head of asset allocation Citibank. But he came from a poor mining family. So my mother's side was a rich family from uh, uh, the Black Forest that sold their, their wood cutting and forest business and paper mill. And uh, the grandmother then received the money in about 85 and was advised by a bunch of bankers. And that's when I discovered my love for Bertolt Brecht. He is the author of uh, the Three Penny Opera, Mac the Knife, for example. Yeah? And he said that to rob a bank is nothing. A real professional opens a bank. Yeah. Eine Bank auszurauben ist gar nichts, ein echter Gangster gründet eine. And uh, my grandmother had received quite a lot of cash and the bankers advising her were churning her portfolio for commissions and fees, advising her to go into bonds when the bonds were headed down or even headed for default, were going to switch to equities when they were at the top of the market. And uh, yeah, so it was quite natural that when I came across the Midas touch describing um, the, uh, the work of Warren Buffett that I quite liked it. And uh, Henrik Freie's father here from Berlin, FUV, Vermögensverwaltung at the time, wanted it in German for his value investing clients. So I spent a summer sitting in a villa in Grunewald uh, and translated the Midas touch into German. And uh, that's how I thought about the theory of value investing. And having watched my grandmother lose the money, I thought, okay, I will, I will uh, not do that. I'll buy fundamental assets. The second key event in my life was that I grew up in Mainz on the Rhine and uh, we had an event in Chernobyl, the uh, nuclear disaster, and the, nu and the clouds, as you may know, stopped twice on the way across Europe. They stopped on the Rhine, so in Rheinland-Pfalz you were allowed to play in the sand pits and in the grass, but in Wiesbaden across the Rhine you're not allowed to play in the grass and sand pits because of radiation. And again, they stopped, of course, on the French border. In, in France, you could even drink the milk and everything else. In Germany, we outlawed people drinking the polluted milk. We sent it as a donation to Africa. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, and uh, in, at this occasion, uh, crossing the, uh, the nuclear cloud, my mother, who's a statistician, noticed that her friends on the right side of the Rhine didn't end up being sick of cancer. But a number of friends who were playing in the sand pits in the radiation polluted area got cancer and a personal friend of ours uh, got very sick, asked for euthanasia, was very emotional. So I saw that environmental impacts can be quite important for people's lives, and I wanted to do something against it. And I was, my father always says that the beautiful women were in the, in the Green Party and the demonstrations, so I joined them. But we get carried away from the police all the time, and we sprayed padding instead of pershing on the walls, but we still got carried away by the police, so it didn't really work. So I thought I'd do a Bloomberg. That is, I thought I would, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, study mathematics and economics and become a billionaire or something like that and then do good things. And uh, well, I followed the value investing approach and it worked very well. We, we, I made my first money um, as an investment banker for nine months. And nine months I worked at Deutsche Bank and then that money I invested and we, made, we multiplied the money 13 times over 10 years. So it was a very good value investing track record. Um, but uh, towards the end of that period, uh, Sasha, I had met Sasha and married Sasha, who is an uh, environmentalist from Russia. And we came across a guy called Charlie Kleisner. And he said, Jochen, uh, you are by now the biggest sponsor of Greenpeace in Russia, but you invest in oil companies. Do you see an issue there? And I said, well, not really. You know, I, I honestly make money. I pick the biggest, best value investing opportunities, price earnings ratio of three, Luke Oil, and I sell it at a PE of 20. Um, but he said, well, maybe you should worry about how you make your money that you give to good causes. Yeah? Maybe there's a moral issue here. And then uh, Sasha uh, uh, organized a trip with Greenpeace to the north of Russia. Um, there's a map behind you that usually hangs here, but uh, I can maybe get to it uh, here. No, it's not here, not there, unfortunately. Anyway, the north of Russia, you can imagine Siberia, Arctic Circle. Every uh, winter, um, Everything freezes there. The oil that's spilled freezes, the snow freezes, everything freezes. And in the spring, when the, when the ice melts, the oil that was spilled over the summer also melts, uh, flows into the rivers. And the amount of oil spilled every winter in the Arctic Ocean 
is 5 million tons. That's equal to the amount that BP spills in the Gulf of Mexico, 5 million tons every winter. Because the Russians measure the oil production not at the well, but in Moscow. So everything that's lost on the way, they don't care. And at one point, there was an oil puddle the size of Luxembourg, and they were being denied on the local level, the federal level, and Bill Clinton called Yeltsin, uh, tried to reach him, nobody passed the message, and finally I was asked to pass the message, because I was an advisor to the Russian government at the time. So we went there and we saw that 5 million tons of oil spill into the Arctic Ocean. We saw a river as big as the Rhine, this thick in oil, and we, we puddled the oil away into a ship, and after half an hour I had to throw up, because oil is po poisonous, yes? And then we went to see the statistics uh, for cancer, and people living and drinking the water with the oil. And of course, people have a much 10 times higher cancer rate from drinking groundwater with oil than they do in other places. And finally, someone showed me the embryo collection of people that are misbirthed, misformed children. And I thought, ah, maybe, just maybe, if I pay one cent less for Luke oil gasoline or one cent more for BP, but I, get, I know I don't kill people when I buy this gasoline, I maybe go for the better gasoline that's higher quality. So that was the first time it became very clear to me recently that uh, as a consumer we have a choice and as the consumers ch change their choices we can have an impact on what we do. So that's sort of the history and from that point onwards uh, Sasha and I decided first of all for moral reasons no longer to invest in things across all asset classes that have a negative impact on the environment. Now that's if you like you know Dreadlocks, Birkenstocks, hip, green, crazy, whatever you like, okay? Um, but uh, I will hope to show you tonight that that's history. And now if you're hard-nosed, brutal, financially minded, and you don't care about the environment, you will still do what I recommend you do for moral reasons. It makes economic sense and it's economic suicide to continue to live in the old world. And that is the point of this speech which I was going to give now. Okay, now it used to be that impact investors are crazy guys sitting in the back pocket of the room somewhere. And this is a keynote I gave at Super Return Berlin in front of 5,000 people, all hard nosed private equity guys, uh, very serious people. And the way that my father came up, how they could listen, is we, we talk about the winners and losers of the green industrial revolution. So, first of all, we live in a fantastic time for entrepreneurs and a fantastic time for investors. You are probably aware of these wonderful mega trends. Uh, we have a middle class. Uh, which is about to double. It took us 150 years to get to a billion. We'll probably get to two billion in the next 10 years. So if you sell any stuff for people to consume, you probably have twice as many clients in 10 years' time. The energy consumption, in spite of much higher resource efficiency, is about to double again. People are moving into cities. 6.5 billion people in cities. Uh, global GDP is still growing. Oil demand is growing. It's a wonderful time to live. The only issue we have is that we're causing serious damage to our environment. Uh, in Beijing, you can't go on the street. Everything, people are wearing masks because it's uh, so polluted. And the total impact of the damage we do on the environment is quite dramatic. I studied did the physics, Jugendforscht, and then mathematics, so I know numbers a bit. Uh, you also do know numbers. So here's an interesting number. If we just lose the Greenland ice cap, global sea levels will go up seven meters. So just the ice on Greenland will increase sea levels by 7 meters. That means your real estate in Miami, London, Hamburg is all underwater. If you add Antarctica, you have 60 meter higher sea levels. That's 67 meters. That sounds crazy, but that's just not as much. We went up 100 meters already from the last ice age. So uh, we are currently in a beach town of the future in Berlin. Yeah? So uh, this is the effect of what we're doing. London underwater, and you can see where the Danish are very much ahead in, in, in renewable energy and, and, and so forth. So there's a real threat to humanity. Uh, this is not a map that I invented, it's public information, globalfloodnets.com.net, uh, and uh, NASA now predicts at least half a meter by 2050. So we definitely have an increased uh, sea level. You all survived this summer, this summer. Uh, it was much hotter, if you case, case you haven't noticed. And the reality is, that we as a species will not be able to survive if we miss the two degree target. And we're currently headed for a six degree higher target, which is almost guaranteed wipe, up, wipe out of humanity. Most species will not be able to survive. The risk profile is so drastic that most people don't pay attention anymore. But I promise not to scare you anymore, but talk about the fantastic opportunities now. 
Here is, first of all, why we're in this mess and what you should think about invest as investors. If you think about the externality of emitting CO2, it's 130 euros per ton. It's the sum of local health cost, 60 euros. So if you have cars driving up and down the street, people walking down the streets get asthma, allergies, and cancer. That is not sitting next, uh, breathing in the air from cars is as unhealthy as smoking. And just as smoking in bars and inside is outlawed, people will laugh at us and they laugh. Today we had, we had doctors appearing on US TV saying smoking is good for your health. Remember that? But we don't because you're too young. We have similar people saying that driving is fine. It's not fine. It's very unhealthy. This is the World Health Organization. A ton of CO2 associate costs 160 euros. The climate cost is 70 euros. So if I don't care about the climate, just care about local health, I should charge 60 euros. And in Sweden, where Natalie is from, people charge 130 euros. As an economist, you know from Economics 101, full costs and externalities must be priced at the real cost to society. If not, you cause damage, it's chaos. In the European Union, you can buy the right to cause damage here to Thomas. I can buy for 15 euros, I can buy the right to cause 130 euros of damage. That's our current system. And more impressively, worldwide, on average, we are paying people 150 euros to cause 130 euros of damages. This applies to me as well. I'm an investor in a paper mill in the Black Forest again, as of two months ago. And we pay not 20 cents per kilowatt hour as normal German city citizens for electricity, not 5 cents for normal spot price for electricity. We pay 3 cents. We get rewarded with a low energy price because we consume so much energy. So the German government gives subsidies to reduce power prices to people who consume lots of energy. So the more energy we save, the higher our price will get. In India, you have people getting electricity at break low prices. In China, in Indonesia, in Russia, in Brazil, people drive at oil and gas prices below market prices. So we are paying people on average 150 euros per ton to emit CO2. Now, if you do your value investing analysis over a full business cycle of any business and you plug in 130 euros per ton of CO2 as opposed to minus 150 today, your whole economic models break and you have to think about very hard. So that's why in France, the government is now asking people to put in 130 euros into their business plans. By law in France, by 2030, the price will, 100, will be 100 euros a ton. And many, many of the business that you know today will no longer exist simply because this crazy uh, uh, mismatch will disappear. And again, this is not uh, something made up. This is the, the global uh, alliance by the G20 Task Force for, fin for Financial Stability, Professor Edenhofer, who sits in Einstein's office. Yeah, this is not Mickey Mouse numbers. Um, since I was wearing the dreadlocks, uh, or rather green hair and the orange tail, uh, I've joined a group called the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. It's no longer the case that these concerns are just a few green crazy people. 28 trillion under management is the members of this uh, unit organization today. And they're calling very clearly for governments to adhere to the Paris Agreement. Because if not, there's no point investing money because our children and grandchildren will not have an earth living on. They're asking for a reasonable ton price per ton of CO2 of 130 euros a ton, which is the externality. Any economist, any business person, any rational person knows. And the constitution of the European Union says, Verursacherprinzip. If I cause damage, I have to pay for it. I learned when I come to a, a, a campsite, I try to leave it cleaner than I find it, right? And of course, people are asking to phase out the fossil fuel subsidies. So if you drive today from, from your home to work with a diesel car, you get a tax deduction. Remember that? These sort of subsidies have to disappear. And we have to adopt the G20's climate risk disclosure rules. All of the companies we're analyzing as value investors will need to provide the carbon footprint and their business plan consistent with reducing emissions. What does it mean to have two degrees target? It means by 2050 we have zero emissions. Zero emissions is our target by 2050. We're already in 2018. Yes, to get to zero emissions today means by 2030 nobody will buy a single combustion engine car anymore. You cannot buy a diesel or a petrol car in 2030 because they live for 20 years. And in 2050, we must have no emissions. That's why we will not have any of these combustion engine cars if we want to survive. But on to the good news. 
Uh, sorry, also one more point. Some of you said already to Natalie, is it possible to be a value investor and have impact? And I believe not only have we moving to ESG, environmental social governance standards, but I believe impact investing will replace ESG. Investors are no longer happy to know, well, BP is 95% compliant with an ESG. BP still has a negative impact on the environment, and 80% of the pensioners in Holland voted to have positive impact pensions. So ABP, a big pension fund, is putting 80% of their assets into impact investing. Impact investing means nothing but I have risk, return, and an externality. What is my externality? Am I buying child pornography, therefore I'm promoting you know, businesses for four-year-old girls, or am I uh, doing cluster bombs, or am I doing coal, whatever it is. I'd like to know as a client, what am I, where's my money going, and what's the impact. Um, so I think risk, return, and impact is the new normal, and we're happy to discuss in more detail. But moving on to solutions, happy news. This is uh, Desert Tech, which is the same picture as uh, uh, back where the drinks are. Uh, Desert Tech said, with this little uh, spot of solar uh, power plant, I can power the whole world. That's all I need. At the time, the prices were too high for solar, and the cost of the cable was too high, and today we can do it in a decentralized fashion. Why? Because the world we live in has changed dramatically. For the last 20 years, basically, it was crazy to invest in renewable energy, because renewable energy cost in Berlin 70 cents per kilowatt hour, in Dubai 40 cents per kilowatt hour, today we're down to 2 cents per kilowatt hour in Dubai, and that's equivalent to $4 per barrel of oil. So if there's one number you need to remember, it's this number. The Abu Dhabi authorities worked out that they would be sorry to, buy, to build this <coughs> solar plant if they could produce oil at $4 a barrel. As you know, oil costs $80 a barrel now, so solar power is 40 times more competitive, sorry, 20 times more competitive than uh, oil to make power today. So oil is no longer competitive. Coal is no longer competitive. Even gas is no longer competitive. In Austin, Texas, under Trump, in a free market where oil is subsidized effectively, coal is subsidized, shale oil is cheap, nuclear power doesn't have any limits, people choose nuclear solar power over anything else. There's, there will be no more new coal power plants installed with, or, or nuclear plants just because it makes no more economic sense. Of course, most people uh, don't use oil for power, they use it for driving. And here, this is the uh, beautiful back of Klaas Helmke. Uh, Schöne Rücken können auch entzücken, we say in German. He is, uh, he is helping the Pope out of his new electric car. Uh, we tried to give a, a Tesla to the Pope, but the Pope said that's too big. But this uh, Nissan Leaf here costs 20,000 euros. My parents drive it, my wife and I drive it. It saves us 1,000 euros a year. So in 20 years, it pays for itself already. Secondly, we have a um, company in Munich called the Mobility House that uses the battery in this car whenever there's no sun and there's no wind. Where's the wind? Oh, there. Uh, it provides power to the grid. Whenever there's too much wind and sun, it buys power. And buying and selling power from this car, the car owner makes another 1,000 euros. So I bought the car to drive to work, to drive this around, but I make a thousand euros buying and selling power. Uh, in other words, in 10 years, this car pays for itself. The business plan of Nissan is actually that I give you the key for the Nissan Leaf and say, have the car, promise me to plug it in, it's free of charge. This is not a joke, this is reality. Yeah? We're two or three years away, you'll get the car for free. The car will probably drive itself, it has its own battery and it solves the whole storage problem. Solar and renewables are expensive if you have to add storage, but here you get the storage for free. So what does it mean? It means, to my mind, we're in a new industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution uh, was missed in Prussia. You're here, uh, south of us is Oranienburger Straße, north of us is what's called the Feuerland. Prussia used to be controlled by the big Junkers, by the big landowners and they didn't want to hear anything of this steam engine stuff in Britain. It took for the French to roll over Germany and go all the way to Moscow before the Germans caught on to the first industrial revolution, the steam engine. The leaders in the first industrial revolution were the English and they established the British Empire. The second industrial revolution were when the steam engines were replaced by combustion engines and by uh, uh, television and telecommunications. And uh, this is what the second revolution looked like. 
In 1900, on the streets of Berlin or New York, this was New York Easter Day Parade, you didn't have a single car. This is before the age of internet, this is before international trade. You had problems with the horses because of the stuff coming out the back of the horses. Yeah? At international climate conference today, you had international horse dung conferences back then. The best investments were the horse breeders and the whip makers and the carriage makers. The first Dow Jones Index had 50 components, of which 13 years later only Western Union survived. So as a value investor, keep this figure in mind, in 13 years without the internet, 99% of the index wiped out. Why? Because none of the whip makers became a piston maker. Yeah? Keiner der Peitschenmacher wurde ein Zündkerzenbauer. None of the carriage makers became a car maker, even though it looks very similar. Yeah? None of the horse feed makers became an oil driller. The new champions were JP Morgan, Carnegie, Siemens, Deutsche Bank. They didn't exist in 1900. They all came up new. And we are a new industrial revolution like this right now. So everything we thought worked well in value investing, you know, how did my business plan go last, 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 last two or three business cycles? Okay, on average for the business cycle, I can make a conservative forecast for my value investing. All fine and well. But if nobody buys your whips anymore, that value investment is worth nothing. So an industrial revolution destroys your financial markets. Many of the models that used to work will disappear. As the IMF and World Bank say, 80% of the jobs we have today will disappear in 10 years. That also means 80% of the companies or more will disappear. And we have therefore decided we need to take value investing further. We can't just look at cash, bonds and listed equities. We also have to look at private equity, infrastructure and real assets and try to find something where value could be protected. Right? Um, so what happens in this industrial revolution and, and what drives it? What are the winners in this industrial revolution? Who are the new industrial revolution? The new industrial revolution going on I call the green industrial revolution. Um, some call it industry 4.0. Some call it the third industrial revolution like Jeremy Rifkin. Um, in this in green industrial revolution, we have an energy revolution. So it's cheaper now to do solar in Berlin. It's six cents per kilowatt hour. Wind in um, Denmark is five cents per kilowatt hour. We pay 20 cents, yeah? So solar is a quarter of what we pay for power in Germany. Then the nexus of transport with energy is what causes a revolution because I use electric car to provide the storage that energy needs. Then I have a fintech revolution. We have a company here in Berlin uh, called Mobisol. And they provide um, a solar panel onto anybody's roof anywhere in the world as long as they have a mobile phone to pay. They lease the solar panel. They pay two cents before 6 p.m. They have light at night. They don't pay. They take the panel away. Um, circular economy models are taking over. Circular economy means that uh, the head of Unilever, Paul Pullman, said at Davos, you know, the consumers should do something, something. And the girl stood up and said, no, 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 don't you call me a consumer ever again. So what do you mean? I'm a user, OK? I may use this car, but I don't want to own this car. I may use this flat, but I don't want to own the flat. So we're moving to a circular economy where people return everything they get, and we get much higher quality printers that don't break one month after the guarantee period, but they print forever, right? Mm -hmm. Matches that work forever. IT, artificial intelligence, when we leave this house with our Tesla, the Tesla tells the house and the power goes down, right? Or if I approach something else, the, the door goes up. And agriculture, of course. It's amazing what you can do and achieve with sustainable agriculture. It used to be something crazy, the biomilch and bioflesh. Now it's actually cheaper and healthier. We'll get to some examples. So this amazing uh, uh, green revolution is ongoing. That means that there are many, many new companies coming up. And most of the stuff we learned, most of the companies we looked at the last 20 years, in fact, the last 120 years, will no longer be there. And for Germany, our model is Kodak. Yeah? Kodak invented the digital camera. Kodak rejected the digital camera, and Kodak went bankrupt. We in Germany invented the energy transition. We put a cap on the energy transition. We missed the transport transition, and we're about to lose a million jobs and go bankrupt. That's a German model following Kodak. And it's up to guys like you and us, as value investors, to put our head around this and tell our government, hello, if we're missing this energy transition, if we're missing this third industrial revolution, the people who are winning this industrial revolution will determine the future. Why is everybody speaking English tonight? 
because of the first industrial revolution and the English leading it and the Americans leading the second. Who's leading the next industrial revolution? China. China. How many people here have come, have at home a 100% electric vehicle? A bike, a scooter, or a car? One. Okay, that's pretty good. Close to German average. <laughs> <laughs> we have as many total electric vehicles in Germany stock as China adds every month. Okay? How many Chinese do you think travel on 100% electric personal transport? I'm not talking trains or electric buses. Personally, who owns personally? Yes? I, I don't know, but I know in, Sh in Shanghai or in Beijing, they banned uh, the scooters with um, combustion engines, so it's purely electric. Yep. It's amazing. Yep. So there's a billion Chinese. How many of them? 100% electric? Like 30%. Yep. 250 million Chinese. 100% electric. I don't know where they are. Uh, here they are. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually a very good point. Uh, how many people did actually use a normal bike before? The nice thing about the electric bike is you take the electric, the battery off the back of your bike, you carry it up to your flat, you charge it at night, you put it back. It turns out you're more efficient uh, using electric bike than you are as a human being. In case anybody tells you that a combustion engine car has a chance, to go back to this slide here, the uh, electric engine is 95% efficient. 95 from, from windmill to the wheel, PS, Pferde auf der Straße. The best diesel is 35% efficient. Okay? And how efficient is the cow, you think? If I want to have a steak, how efficient? Energy efficient? 10%. 10%, exactly. But the question is how efficient is the, the um, <coughs> making of the energy? Yes. I mean, um, a, a normal gas, gasoline uh, um, power station has an efficiency rate of about 30%. Yep. I don't know what's about solar panels, but it's Depending not uh, nearly close to 100%. It doesn't matter though. Yes. It does. <laughs> it does. Yes. It does. Yep. No, that's uh, that, so. If, so the question is how, how. One of the question that the chairman of uh, of Blackstone actually asked me on my panel at the Super Return, he said, "Mr. Wehrmann, it's very nice you talk about solar, but you know as well as I do, you need more energy to make a solar panel than it ever generates in its lifetime." It's more or less the same argument, right? And I said, "Yes, that was probably true 50 years ago. That it takes more to make a solar panel than it ever generates. That's we use it only in space. Yeah, it was very expensive. Today, class, it's what one year or half a year." Two, two, two years. So it takes two years in Germany to make the power back you put in, and then it's free energy for the rest of the world. And that's also something you get to get your head around. We're getting to a new world where you will get flat rate energy. Like you have flat rate data now, flat rate energy. You can consume as much as you want. And if you live in, in, in southern hemisphere or in more warm climates, you get three times more energy for your solar panel than you get here. So it is, uh, yeah, the, the, the solar. The efficiency of the energy is, yeah, as I said, after, uh, so it's true that the, the conversion of the solar so sunlight to power is only 25%, but that doesn't matter because you don't put, I mean, the sun bounces off all the time anyway. Yeah? In the case of combustion engine, I cause two thirds of energy to go and cause cancer and, and climate change and so forth. Okay, um, bubble up. So what do, we, what do I focus on? I, I've decided that I focus my day job on investing in growth stage companies, which are going to be the new champions that are in storage, in renewable, and, uh, uh, but not in the assets, but in the enhancement. So you can buy a company that puts a, uh, a plastic foil on the windmill and it freezes uh, three degrees at minus three degrees and not at zero. And so you don't need the other windmills to heat the ones that's freezing and so you make lots more money, or technology to enhance the productivity of solar. General resource efficiency makes lots of sense. Mobility, industrial processes, clean air, clean water, and agriculture are the exciting areas. I think that's where I, as a value investor, see the future today. And uh, it's also important, as you are looking at your, at, your, at your portfolio, to consider the risks that we have today from what's called the carbon bubble. The carbon bubble is the amount of assets that need to be written off in the future, first of all, again, from a moral point of view. If we want to stick to two degrees target, 80% of the proven reserves of oil, gas, and coal cannot be burned. We know that today. 
But again, people said, okay, that's just, we should. In real life, why not burn oil? It uh, makes money. But I just showed you before, oil is only really competitive to, to solar at $4 a barrel. And therefore, many of the forecasts of oil, gas and coal revenues will have to be taken down. Um, the Mark Carney, who is the chairman of the Central Bank of England, thinks 23 trillion euros of future revenues need to be written off. Citibank now estimates 100 trillion euros of future revenues to be written off. Okay, the, the bubble that caused the 2008 financial crisis was the mortgage bubble. There was 15 trillion euros in assets to be written off. So we're already significantly above. And the G20 financial stability force, therefore, is focusing on this carbon bubble risk. And 5 trillion of asset managers have already divested from anything to do with oil, gas and coal. And if you think further, also the suppliers of these industries and the suppliers of the combustion engine cars, the combustion engine car makers themselves, these are all perfect shorts if you have a long short strategy. There's no way it makes any economic sense to hold any of these assets. I'm not saying we will not use oil, gas and coal for many, many years. If I have an oil well that produces and the marginal cost of production is 10, 20, 30 euros and I can sell it at 80, it's a wonderful business. I can make 60 euros per barrel, right? Wonderful. But if I get profits from this business as an oil company, I should not invest it in new wells. I should invest, either return it to shareholders. So as activist value investors, we must tell Shell, we must tell Exxon, please return the equity to us, the capital to us that you're making every day from the oil and gas, or invest it in future-proof uh, technologies. Because oil, gas and coal are certainly not future-proof. And as we focus here on the growth stage investments in our fund or our core activity, the information we get here is crucial for all the other asset classes that we invest in. For example, if I know the oil price will no longer come above, I don't know, it may fluctuate of course, but our estimate is that by 2023 or so, the marginal demand of oil will go down as the increased supply of cars from electric cars will be so high that uh, they will, the people will notice we hit peak oil demand. And that's the day that the price of oil companies collapses, just like RVE collapsed and E.ON collapsed in price. Uh, and if I know that this is coming, then I need to be getting out of my Russian bonds, yeah? because Russia depends on oil. I need to be getting out of my Indonesian, Brazilian and Mexican bonds and equities. And I need to go long countries which are currently importers of oil. Poor countries because they're importing lots of oil. It will be the winners in the future because they don't import the oil anymore and their current account, their budget situation becomes stronger. So Turkey could be a good place to invest because they don't have own oil, they're importing oil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's just to say that most of the fund will be emerging markets. 75% uh, of GDP growth comes from emerging markets today. 95% is expected by the European Commission and China is the leader. If we want our values of a liberal society, a rule-based society to survive, we have to catch up very quickly and we have to make sure our government doesn't follow the Kodak model anymore, but our government or the European Union in the election in May 2019, we vote for people that understand that we have to move forward here. Yeah, this is a, uh, just exactly what we do. We, 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 we invest in companies here and we help companies to go to emerging markets like America but they don't know about energy efficiency. On average, in, the Germ in Germany, we consume only a quarter of the GDP per unit of GDP, a uh, quarter of the energy, compared to um, emerging markets. And so if we take our technologies to these markets, we can really do well. In principle, Germany or Europe is a world leader in resource efficiency. We could be the leader in this fourth industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, and uh, do very well. And we could also at the same time do something for the sustainable development goals, clean water, resource efficiency, sustainable cities, a circular economy and climate change. Um, yeah. Here are some concrete examples of companies that we've recently invested in. These are not listed companies, they are private companies. Uh, one is called Nextwave, that class is on the board of. They make solar wafers now at half the price that Chinese make the solar wafers in the Black Forest. Uh, they expect to have an EBITDA margin of 50% as a result uh, and, and become uh, a global leader with this technology. Another company here, uh, they make uh, paper, no longer from trees, but from grass and from hanf, uh, from uh, Mariana-based uh, material. Hemp, Hemp sorry. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they uh, buy the paper pulp for cellulose for 750 euros. 
the grass you can buy for 150 euros, so you get a 50% higher margin. Uh, and, by the way, if you eat recycled paper, uh, or you have food touching recycled paper, you get the inks from the recycled paper, which is mineral-based, oil-based, gives you cancer. This is what Stiftung Warentest found out two years ago for Christmas, when all the Christmas calendars were covered in Altpapier, which meant that the kids eating the chocolates were eating also the, the, the crude oil with it. And so in Switzerland, uh, recycled paper has been outlawed for food packaging. In China, all import of recycled paper has been blocked. Uh, in Germany, it's on its way as well. So here you can have a company that uh, makes a lot of money and has a positive impact on the environment. This company here, as I said, makes a solar wafer for half the energy and half the price. So you're good for the environment and you make a lot of money. Another exciting company here is called, it's a code name because we haven't invested. This is a charging station for a bus. How long do you think it takes to charge this bus? I've driven it in Helsinki. It's gone around a true of Helsinki. Here it arrives. And how long does it take to charge a bus, big bus? <laughs> Pretty close, yes. <laughs> Four minutes, unfortunately. Four minutes. So it's just enough time for the bio break. Yeah? So this bus is, is cheaper than a diesel bus. Uh, it charges in four minutes. It has no emissions, has no sound. It's really cool. And this one, I don't know if we have it. I forgot today. Yeah? We, have, we could have fed you this stuff today. Uh, it's actually available at Lidl and Rewe and uh, Aldi. Uh, most shops in Germany. It's called Like Meat. And uh, it tastes exactly like a hamburger or like a French fry, what do you call it, fried chicken or, or pulled pork. But it also has a bite, like it's beef. You bite in there, it's like beef. So the stuff, oops, sorry, costs about half of what it costs to make real beef. It's much more efficient and it tastes well. Each of them, we think, could be so-called exponential organizations. Exponential organizations were defined by Singularity University as an organization that addresses a major challenge to humanity, clean power, clean packaging, clean transport, uh, sustainable food, and that could reach a billion people through digitalization, and each of them could be unicorn. So I think these are the future win winners, the future uh, champions of our society. Um, so we think that the Green Revolution presents hard-nosed investors a great opportunity. I would love, as Sasha said, for all of you to think that as value investors, you are leaders in our society because you're not speculating day right back and forth. You don't take the stupid sales guys' recommendations, but you think long term. And as, soon as you think long term, then you have to take the decision to invest in things that are sustainable. And in Germany, in the Benelux, in Scandinavia, we are importers of energy and therefore we're extremely resource efficient. We consume one eighth the CO2 per GDP. Um, and by exporting this resource efficiency globally, we can really make a contribution and make lots of money as investors. So this is my final slide. So I think we can move from, from cowboy capitalism, as I like to call it. Yeah, I, I really believe in free markets and the price signal, but I don't believe in a world where you know, Apple doesn't pay taxes anywhere or where you know, people don't, are not subject to the same rules as everybody else. We can change to civil capitalism, where the shareholders, like us, as value investors, demand of companies to be responsible, to make sure that they behave fairly and that we have a future for the world. And uh, by the way, if you have uh, solar power in most places of Earth, there'll be less demand for oil. And who are the biggest beneficiaries of oils? These are the guys in Saudi Arabia who chop off 40 heads in a day. Yeah? Guys like Mr. Putin guys like Mr. Trump, right? all of them will have less money in a world where we have decentralized solar power, and that's the future. The job market for dictators is becoming much worse as we move away from uh, rent-seeking oil, gas, and coal. Um, yeah, and in the end, we have the opportunity to get a, a planet which is inhabitable for us all. And what we're seeing is a change in the investment community from just 12 million divesting 10 years ago to 28 trillion committed to divest today. And I hope the value investing community joins us in full force, but I'm very, very happy to discuss in detail. That was the real point, instead of being tied to this spot, was to discuss with you and ask, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you.